the earliest spy systems uh, were set up by um, people who had absolute power. In other words, uh, kings, kings of kings and uh, emperors. And in fact, to be fair, the Roman system did not catch up with them uh, until Augustus, uh, because Augustus was the first person in an equivalent position. to the Spymasters podcast. In this episode, we've got top novelist Peter Tonkin talking to us about spycraft in the ancient world. We've got loads more goodies coming up though, so make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up in the next episode, we've got a real treat, the absolute godfather of British spy writing, Nigel West. So tell your friends, drop us a follow and join us on Spymasters. But right now, I'll hand you over to me talking to Peter Tonkin about Caesar's spies. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure, pleasure. to have you on Spy Masters. So we're here today to talk about spies in the ancient world. Uh, uh, obviously, it's the basis of a few of your many novels involve uh, spying in the Roman world just at the end of the Republic. I'd quite like to start, though, by thinking about the definition of spy given that what we're talking about in the ancient world isn't quite the same as what we're talking about in the modern world so how would you define the spies that you're writing about well in the ancient world um spying on a practical level um started with lookouts and then uh, obviously lookouts needed to send messages so um communication became important and messages eventually became encoded. Then as individual city states began to expand and come against each other, a lot of information was collected by way of traders and merchants going from one place to another. And that's a system that's lasted right up to the modern day. You only have to think of the case of Greville Wynne which was turned into a film with Benedict Cumberbatch called The Courier, uh, which was the true story of a a, a businessman who had uh, contacts in Moscow who was asked by MI6 to carry information and bring information back from Moscow, uh, but he was caught and locked up. Then there's obviously the diplomatic service, which in modern times is seen as a uh, a very useful method of spying on many levels. Uh, obviously, diplomats, uh, <laughs> as the British government has just announced, is the case with Chinese, for instance, um, come across, mm. they um, help local businesses, they help uh, local councillors on the assumption that the councillors will owe them something when they move from local government to uh, central government. But just and on an aside, we might come back to it later, uh, the Romans were really bad at diplomacy. Then that's all looking outwards. Uh, looking inwards, of course, um, you've got the internal uh, intelligence networks, uh, the ancient equivalents of our MI5, there were specially trained warriors. The Romans were heavily influenced by classical uh, and pre-classical Greeks, and they were most impressed, uh, as we are, I suppose, uh, by the Spartans and the way in which uh, youthful uh, warriors were trained in Sparta to be completely self-sufficient, a bit like our S-A-S-S-B-S and commandos, they, uh, in fact, you couldn't be a Spartan warrior uh, until you had uh, lived alone and survived uh, for several weeks with no help at all, and then killed a slave, uh, just a random slave you happened to come across, uh, before you reported back in. And the Romans, uh, although by that time Sparta was a kind of Disneyland, for them they all went to see it they were very impressed with that kind of military training 
And then they started training their own troops in that kind of uh, those kind of skills. Um, though, of course, the main um, machine of conquest that they used were the legions. Taking a, a, a step back, so obviously the Romans are not the first classical um, uh, empire. What are the earliest spy systems that we know about pre-Roman? Well, um, the earliest spy systems uh, were set up by um, people who had absolute power. In other words, uh, kings, kings of kings and uh, emperors. And in fact, to be fair, the Roman system did not catch up with them uh, until Augustus, uh, because Augustus was the first person in an equivalent position. But uh, we're looking at the Hittites. Uh, the Persians, the Parthians, the Egyptians, of course, um, Macedonians, uh, Babylonians, the Carthaginians, uh, to a certain, well, Carthaginians are slightly different because they've got a, a, a ruling system which is a bit like the Roman system. But I think probably some of your listeners may want to correct me on this. Whereas Rome was surrounded by sort of verdant greenery and farms, etc., and there was no great pressure on them to go exploring in the early days, um, the Carthaginians, of course, being on the north coast of Africa, even though it was uh, greener in those days, they tended to look out rather than in. And so the whole concept, uh, of the Carthaginians uh, was that they had feet that needed to signal. Um, they went to other places to set up trading posts and needed to find out about the people who lived there in case they had to conquer them rather than negotiate with them. And so uh, they had a completely different approach to intelligence than the Romans did, which is important uh, because uh, in the Punic Wars, Scipio, Scipio Af Africanus, the great Roman general, learned a lot from the um, Carthaginian general uh, Hannibal, uh, the younger Hannibal. He learned about um, secret messages. Um, they wrote... Uh, um, as many people did for centuries following, on wax tablets, for instance. And what they did with the wax was they poured it over a wooden board and then they wrote on it with a pointed stick. But what um, Hannibal did was he wrote his messages on the wood and then poured wax over the top so that people receiving his messages simply either scraped or melted the wax off and they got the message. Later on, of course, uh, Caesar famously uh, came up with uh, a transposition code that he liked. It's still called Caesar's code. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, A became Z, um, B became A, C became etc., etc., etc. It was Greek, so Alpha became Omega, etc., etc. And that transposition code uh, is still being used um, by the uh, by the Tudors in in the days of uh, Robert Poley, uh, Christopher Marlowe, Francis Walsingham, etc., though they have very much more cunning codes as well. When we get to the um, early Romans, obviously, as you say, some of them are, are learning off their predecessors, but there seems to be a dividing line on intelligence pre-Augustus and post-Augustus. I mean, lots of yeah. things in the Roman world fall into that category. So can we just talk about uh, Republic? Because obviously it isn't no. like these societies we've talked about. It's not a centralised single autocracy sending no. itself out. It's more complicated than that. And can you talk about a little bit about how intelligence picks that uh, sort of sits in that picture of warring individual kind of uh, generals? Yes, uh, it is uh, very much inward looking. The... People like Scipio, who learned from um, their opponents, um, found it difficult to pass that information on because very often uh, they were either retired uh, forcibly um, or uh, they um, were replaced 
militantly and, and effectively, or um, there was civil war. And so there was very little communication. The Senate made this situation worse in practical terms um, because one hesitates to compare them to, to our House of Commons and House of Lords at the moment, but very often uh, information would arrive and it would take the Senate ages to discuss it, come to a, some sort of agreement on it and decide what ought to be done about it. And usually when they did that, then they chose someone they thought would be a suitable leader and they sent him to lead. And it, the effectiveness of that depended entirely on their understanding of the situation. Um, and although things got very much better um, after Augustus, even Augustus um, made one or two so we say, false steps to begin with, uh, the most famous of which uh, was sending uh, Varus to northern Germany, as Augustus saw it, to a peaceable place that they were just Romanizing. All the northern Germans had um, settled down. They'd been conquered. They spoke Latin. Uh, their leaders had been in the legions. Everything seemed absolutely fine uh, to, to Augustus. So he sent Varus, uh, who was who was a pretty brutal general, uh, and Varus was supposed to just Romanize the place, build villas and olive groves going and, and, and vineries and things and settle everyone down. And it was a complete miscalculation on Augustus's part and, and whoever was advising him, uh, one assumes probably Agrippa, though Agrippa got very few things wrong, bless him. But yes, further complication, of course, was that all of the members of the Senate were um, looking to stab each other in the back. Just to pick up a little bit yeah. on that, I mean, one of the, so even if there was good intelligence reaching Augustus that Germany wasn't quite as ready to be Romanized as he hoped it would be. I right. mean, obviously there's, a, there's always a difference, isn't there, between the intelligence as it's sent to the person receiving the intelligence and how that intelligence is received and how it plays into somebody's existing... Yeah kind of expectations and, and, and hopes and wants. And I just, I, I wonder if that's just a classic case of even if the intelligence was good, it wouldn't have mattered because Augustus had that kind of Roman arrogance and a kind of um, sense of Roman purpose that wouldn't have been derailed by information to the yeah, country. That's absolutely right. That is a spin-off of the situation anyway, because for many years earlier, even than Augustus, the Senate had assumed and continued to assume uh, that they were the pinnacle of, of um, civilization. Everyone else, all of the uh, people around them, were lesser. And what the, um, what the Senate believed was truth. And they very often made pretty bad mistakes because, exactly as you say, they were overconfident and, and very, very fully uh, in belief of their own superiority. And they didn't like to hear stuff that disagreed with them. That We see that happening time and time again. They didn't like Cleopatra, for instance, and all she wanted to do at that stage, Cleopatra the Seventh, Philopater, her, her ambition was that Rome and Egypt would come together. And yet the Senate hated her. She was a nasty foreign lesser being. And, and you know, the, it, not just her, but embassy after embassy was just looked down on and disregarded because they assumed that they were superior, you know, it's. Um, ooh, so in, yeah, in that, um, absolutely. And in that Republican period, as I understand it, and um, part of my understanding of this was uh, gleaned from reading your um, excellent books, which are set in the kind of immediate aftermath of Caesar's assassination, um, that what, what, yeah. What spy networks there were, were kind of the individual spy networks of individually powerful men. And they were just as much being used against each other as yeah. they were being used in the service of Rome. Yes. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of definitive example of this 
uh, Cicero's um, breaking down uh, of the Catiline uh, conspiracy, um, Cicero overcame Catiline's conspiracy to grab power in Rome because Cicero's personal spy network was more efficient than Catiline's was. And Cicero at that time was in a particularly powerful situation and was able to have Catiline arrested and actually um, executed because his spy net, his internal spy network was so efficient. And yet, you know, um, when all of his closest friends were going up to murder Caesar. He had absolutely no idea what was going on and, in fact, was extremely out- upset. He left him out of it. Caesar, he had the best spy network in Rome. And like Augustus later on, he just didn't believe what he was being told. When the post-mortem was con- conducted on his body, there was in his sleeve an unopened a uh, letter for lack of a better word it was it, obviously it was a it was some kind of writing anyway which detailed the names of every single person at the center of the plot to kill him and he he didn't read it it was given to him on the way into being killed it was a list of all the people who were going to do it and he never looked at it mm. you know just ooh that's bad intelligence <laughs> Yeah, well, it's good intelligence, but, you know, bad timekeeping. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you said that the other, uh, w- when we were sort of uh, liaising before we talked, you said that there was one other uh, major failure of intelligence that was quite illustrative of this early period, which was Crassus's defeat. Uh, can you just talk yes. us through that and what happened with that? Well, of course. And, uh, and uh, Crassus was the richest man in Rome, famously so. Um, He had amassed his huge fortune because basically he had invented the fire service and he had a whole lot of people who were expert in putting out fires. But whenever a fire started and there were a lot of fires in Rome uh, because the buildings were rubbish, hardly any of them as marble as we see them nowadays, the insulae were, were just clapboard rubbish. Whenever somebody's buildings went on fire, uh, Crassus would get his men and he'd go round to the owner of the building. He's saying, now, do you want to give me uh, uh, half of what the building's worth? or And uh, my men will put the fire out. Or do you want me to uh, go off and just let it go down to the ground? And so he amassed an enormous fortune like that. So great, in fact, that he was able to pay for his own legions. And he paid for three legions, 17th, 18th and 19th. And he, in 54 BCE, he took them uh, to Armenia and then uh, the, uh, the objective was to go via Armenia and into Parthia. Now, Parthia was basically what is modern Iran, only it's much bigger and famously enormously rich. And um, Crassus did seem to be somebody who just wanted more and more and more. Uh, And so he took his son Publius uh, and uh, another pretty effective general. um, And he spent the summer of 54 trying to get through into uh, Parthia. What intelligence Crassus sent in seems to have been financial. He sent in traders because he wasn't really interested in the Parthians' military um, strength. He was interested in their financial matters. Um, But the time that he spent there allowed the Parthian king Orodes and his general Serenus to learn about the legions and learn about Crassus's technique in battle. And the technique in battle that Crassus used was simply to send his legions in, and he was used to overwhelming his opponents. Now, Serenus, his troops were mostly mounted. He had 
heavily armoured cataphrases uh, on armoured horses, and he had much lighter uh, cavalry with bows and arrows. And Crassus was not particularly worried because everyone knew that mounted archers were of limited use in a battle because they ran out of arrow. General Serenus took this on board and his preparation for battle involved making millions and millions and millions of extra arrows and loading them onto a camel train, which he could take with him. And so they ended up on a, uh, a huge flat desert near Kahai. Um, and Crassus did what Crassus always did. Um, and Serenus sent his archers to uh, meet them. And the archers just kept firing. And even when the Romans did the famous tortoise, the testudo, um, their shields were never quite perfectly together, so arrows could pierce them. In any case, they only protected the top half of the body. And Parthian bowmen were shooting at their legs as well. So it didn't stop hour after hour of Crassus's troops broke. And then they sent the heavy armour in and um, they killed his son. They forced Crassus uh, to sue for peace. Crassus went to the general and tried to uh, negotiate, but something went wrong. Uh, Not sure what. And Crassus was killed. Famously, possibly not accurately, Uh, He was killed by having molten gold poured down his throat. However, that is, uh, whether it's true or not, uh, it's certainly true that his head was chopped off and used as a prop in a play in front of the uh, uh, King of Kings, Orontes, uh, later on. 20,000 killed, 10,000 were taken prisoner, and 10,000 got away. So he lost three quarters of his army, his son and his head. And it it so happened that the man who led the 10,000 survivors out, like Xenophon leading the Greeks to the sea, was Cassius. It was that action that cemented his position in Rome. But it was intelligence, failure of intelligence. Were there any kind of intelligent successes in this earlier period, or was it all a a story of Roman arrogance and failure? Individual uh, generals set up intelligence uh, systems that worked well. Caesar famously uh, did so, obviously. Um, He managed to get intelligence from Britain. He certainly had intelligence uh, in um, Gaul and um, northern Italy through the Alps. And in spite of what happened on the Ides of March, did pass it all on. Because although uh, Octavian had been um, with Caesar uh, on campaign in Spain and through uh, into uh, Germany, and he and Caesar would ride in Caesar's coach together. And it is supposed that at that time, Caesar told Octavian, a lot of the technique he had used to be successful. Of course, Octavian became Augustus and started using those techniques as well and passing them on um, to his closest friend and greatest general, uh, Agrippa, who was, Agrippa was just awesome. He's one of my great heroes, is Agrippa. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. What about Scipio? Didn't he have some quite strong intelligence successes in the second Punic War? Yes, Yes. he had learned it uh, very much from Hannibal and famously it was Scipio who sent Lucinius, uh, Lucinius, I think, um, senior centurion during the second Punic War into uh, the camp in disguise uh, as a deserter and in order to establish that this man was a deserter and give him reason to desert, he had him beaten uh, and 
the uh, the enemy simply did not believe because of the reputation uh, that the Romans had that anyone would voluntarily uh, undergo such humiliation for any reason whatsoever. So they assumed that because uh, the centurion had been beaten, beaten to within an inch of his life, then he must be telling the truth when he said he was deserting and and was coming over to the enemy. He was as uh, an undercover project, and he sent an enormous amount of information back to Scipio. Uh, and this was during the North African campaign, of course, before Scipio managed to stop Hannibal uh, in Italy itself, uh, before he got his elephants to Rome. Let's move out of the Republican period and towards um, the imperial period. Let's talk about Octavian. Augustus, we've mentioned him a bit. How did he revolutionise the use of intelligence in uh, the wider Roman Empire? Yes, he did. Um, The Bible is helpful there. It's the first sentence of the second chapter of St Luke's Gospel. And it came to pass in those days that word came down from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first done when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. The first half is enormously important because it shows for the first time in, you know, in a broad record that a Caesar Augustus had the ability to send to every single place in the world to either conduct a census or to exercise or to collect a tax. And that scale of intelligence uh, was completely unknown earlier within the Roman Empire. And it was because Augustus had set up, joined together pre-existing systems. Uh, There was what effectively was the postal system that Caesar had helped so that there were way stations on all of the routes in the empire, all of which, of course, led to Rome. Augustus then used military people, speculatories, to pass and collect messages and orders along the roads to all the far-flung outposts of the empire. Local people, governors, etc., etc., they had their own men, people they could trust, even more than Augustus could trust his messengers. Um, So that system continued until... uh, the end of the first century, when Domitian wanted something more efficient, and he then tasked the the grain counters, the people whose job it was to go all over the empire um, assessing um, the amount of uh, grain, wheat, barley, oats, etc., etc., to feed the army, etc., Domitian tasked them with becoming spies, and not just spies, executioners, etc., etc. Though, of course, people had used them, uh, uh, speculatories, for instance, as executioners uh, earlier on. Herod famously used uh, his speculatories uh, bodyguard, like by Rome, uh, to remove the head of John the Baptist um, mm-hmm. when Salome uh, removed a large number of her clothes uh, in front of him to his uh, great edification. Um, can we talk, talk a little bit more about the Frumentari? What, right. Do we know much about their organisation and their reach and the, and who was in charge and how they fitted in when they, did they, they report directly to the emperor and how long well, did they last? They lasted for centuries. Um, their headquarters was on the Sicilian Hill uh, in Rome, and they reported directly to the well. Their leaders 
uh, reported directly to the emperor um, via elements of the Praetorian Guard, if need be. Um, and because their day job, so to speak, was to go everywhere in the empire, their reach was infinite. Augustus, following on from Caesar, and then uh, other emperors after him, um, as described, for instance, in, in Mary Beard's Emperor of Rome, successive emperors saw their job as being uh, to keep an eye on the entire empire. And were people frightened of the Frumentari? Yes. Yes. They, um, they were more... They were more like AGB, uh, the FSB or the Spetsnaz uh, in reputation um, than, uh, by, than an actual post office. But of course, Arden Post Office has got a pretty um, bad reputation yes. um, as well. But yes, they, there was nothing they couldn't do. Um, they, uh, they, could, they could arrest, they could question. They torture, they could execute, um, with uh, and then tell the emperor about it later, so to speak. The their reputation was probably um, greater than you know was warranted. The Romans had a reputation which they built on. So, uh, say mm-hmm. for instance, um, Paul of Tarsus, who had been a Roman tax collector. Um, before he saw the light, literally, uh, was um, taken, was arrested by villagers, uh, and I can't remember where, and and they were just about to beat him when he told them, you know, uh, civis romanum son, I am a Roman citizen. And it stopped them dead in their tracks because they knew if they hurt a genuine, fully paid up Roman citizen, the next thing that would happen was that they were going to get a cohort or door asking them what the hell they thought they were doing. To create a culture in which there is that kind of level of, I guess, control, almost terror, you have to have an efficient secret police. You can't do it without. I can't think of an example of a, of a sort of a society that exercises that level of control that doesn't have one. Peter, I think that is a fantastic summary of uh, the of what we know about the Spy Network of ancient Rome. So thank you so much. And um, I would highly recommend anybody interested in the subject to go out and uh, buy your books on Caesar's spies, uh, the novels, um, and you can find them on Amazon. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to give us a follow. Never miss an episode. Next time, we'll be talking to Nigel West. 